Now then, different style of video today in the form of a podcast that I recorded with Kareem Chelly, who is a poker mindset coach. He focuses obviously on the mental side of the game, which is something that is overlooked by a lot of serious and even professional players. So I think there's going to be heaps of value in this video for everyone. Let's get right into it. Sam, welcome to this podcast with me here today. I'm really excited to have you on this episode here because I know you from some of my clients actually, and also from YouTube. I saw some of your videos. Uh, you're traveling around the globe, basically playing cash games everywhere very successfully. And I think we will have a very interesting talk today. I think so. Yeah, I think mindset is a very interesting topic and it's very overlooked even by good players, I think. So that's kind of why when you reached out, I was like very excited to talk about it. And it's actually, awesome. I would say, one of my only natural talents in poker. So yeah. we'll, we'll get onto <laughs> that as well. I've yeah. read books. There's, there's a book I read called The Myth of Poker Talent. Basically, the the philosophy behind it was um, there isn't really natural talent. It's all learned and you can you can learn it. And that's kind of a good thing. Uh, but I think there is a few natural talents in poker. And it's more sort of like how you're built emotionally and stuff like that, I think. But we can get onto mm -hmm. that. Awesome. So can you introduce yourself for those people who don't don't know you, never saw you maybe? Yeah. So my name is Sam Clark. I am the UK's only poker vlogger, although I'm not the most consistent with it, I will be honest. Um, I go through spells of releasing videos once a week or more often, uh, and then spells of a few months where I don't post anything. A lot of that is due to like issues actually being allowed to record in casinos. So in the US, it's much more accepted and welcomed. But basically, I've, I've played cash games full time for a living for five years now. I do a little bit of coaching on the side as well, uh, a little bit of YouTube. And basically, I travel around Europe and the United States uh, playing cash games, kind of 1, 2, up to 5, 10 or 10, 25, whatever I can find and try and do the best I can. And then I post about it on Instagram and YouTube. Awesome. So the first question that I, I really want to ask you today is because I, when I started to play poker, I came into poker because of Ben CB. Yeah, maybe you already like heard that a little bit about yeah. myself. And um, of course, Ben is, is a genius when it comes to MTTs. So mm -hmm. I started with MTTs, but later on, I realized that through the coaching and through other plans that I have, that MTTs are not the best fit for, for my personal situation. And I started to switch to cash games because okay. with cash games, as you know, you can start and end the session whenever you want to. It's a huge benefit. And, and just getting yeah. the volume as well. Like you, you just can't play enough tournaments. I think it's so much harder to be a, like a tournament pro than a cash game pro. And the, and the amount of them is probably so much smaller as well. Like I'm sure there's in every town you go to that has a casino or whatever, there'll be some pros that are just the best player in that casino. They don't really go anywhere. They just go when they feel like and play cash games and that's their job. Whereas like, there's really not that many like two ring tournament pros probably that make a good living and it's stable because even a winning tournament graph is like lose, 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 huge win, lose, lose, mm -hmm. lose. And when you've got bills, like that must be stressful. For sure. Yeah. So th the question that I wanted to ask you is, did you start right away with cash game or how was your way of going there? And why did you focus fully on cash game? Yeah. The first time I ever played poker was a five pound rebuy tournament on my 18th birthday. Um, <laughs> so the story of how I got into poker was, yeah, my 18th birthday, which is when you're allowed to go into casinos in England. Uh, my dad took me to a casino just because it's like, oh, like, this is like a novelty. It's like what you can do now. And we we didn't really like, he played in like a tiny bit of poker, kind of socially with friends every now and again, but he didn't really, he wasn't into it. Um, and we didn't actually go for that reason. We went and just kind of, we sat on these like electronic roulette games or whatever. And we lost like 20 or 30 each or something like that. And I was like, that wasn't even fun. Like, why do people gamble? I don't understand. And then I heard like a load of noise and like shouting coming from the other side of the casino. And it sounded like people were having a lot of fun. So I was like, all right, let's, let's go see what's going on over there. So we walk in, it's like this poker room. And yeah, there's like three guys all in screaming for like a river card or something. <laughs> and I'm like, what is it? Let's, why are we doing this? And then like the registration period was still open. So we jumped in for like five pounds. And I, came, I think I came like second or third, like my first ever try, like no idea what I was doing. Completely just sun run. Um, and then, yeah, I was like, I think I won like two or 300. My dad just like let me keep it, even though he bought me in. And this is when I was like broke, college student or whatever. Um, and I was kind of hooked from that. And then I actually ended up going back a few times and I needed a job. And I saw that they were like advertising for dealers or whatever. I ended up being a poker dealer. And then sort of just from dealing and seeing lots of hands. And then like, I noticed the trend of, uh, I was dealing like the one, two cash game. This is like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So games were pretty good back then as well. Um, and I noticed the trend, there was just all these kind of like rich seeming older guys in suits and stuff. 
they seem to be losing all the time. And then there was this one young guy in a hoodie who seemed to just win every session. And I was like, oh, like, well, what's going on here? So I like, when he was cashing out one day and I was like, finished the work, I went and talked to him and said like, you know, like, how are you doing this? And he told me, it's like, you know, it's a strategy game. You can get good at it. And that was like the, the first like light switch moment for me. Like, oh, this guy's actually doing this and making money and it's like his job. And I was like, that's extremely cool. So that kind of planted the seed. I ended up getting another job for like four years or something, like a more professional, like office job kind of thing. And then the whole time I was working towards uh, playing poker full time, started grinding like one, one games in England. We have like very small, it was actually a 25, 50 P live game with disgusting rick, fairly beatable, but I managed to beat it, move up to one, one. Uh, and then yeah. The rest is history. As soon as I got, uh, I was tracking my results, and as soon as my hourly got higher from playing poker than my hourly rate at work, I was like, all right, done. I'm taking the rest. Mm -hmm. nice. And I quit. I, like I quit it. with a far too small bankroll as well. People always ask me like, when should I like quit my job or whatever? Um, like, how much of a bankroll do I need? And I was like, way more than I had. I got so lucky. Uh, I had four thousand pounds as my my entire like life roll. Wow. And I paid, okay. I, I, th I think I paid six hundred of that for like a deposit and my f first month's rent. Uh, so I had like 3,400 or something. And then the first month I just ran very well. I played constantly. Like I woke up, I went and played poker, slept, repeat. Um, and I made 6,000 and then I had like 10K and then from there I was okay. Nice. But yeah, pretty fast, was... pretty fast. Uh, yeah, I like but, it. Uh, yeah, but like I, I could have just ran bad and lost the 3K and then uh, start again. But yeah, as you said, the rest is history. And you, and you got maybe a little bit lucky in the beginning or it was skill already and also... I was definitely like a winning player, but like it's lucky that I did win the first month because like if I just started on a downswing, then I was just curtains. I was in trouble. True. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent true. So you talked a lot about live poker. Do you also play online? And if yes, which ratio would you say? Uh, definitely yes. My my relationship with online is interesting. Like when I was like just starting out, and well, not just starting out, but like I was a winning player live. I thought that I could. Oh, I'll just jump online, play the same stakes, same result, except it's more convenient, right? But like, if you play a one-two live game and then you play like a one-two or like two hundred NL online, it's night and day different. Like you're gonna get smoked if you don't know what you're doing. And it's like, yeah, it's like six max, and there's these monsters from all over Europe that have just like studied the game so much, and they they know six max strategy inside out, and they can find these little tiny leaks in your game and crush you for them. And yeah, it was a it was a real wake up call uh, where I was like, oh wow, I have like so much to learn still. Uh, so I, yeah, kind of started with that, and then I was like, I got humbled at like playing two hundred and L. I was like, okay, move down. I went down to like ten and L or twenty five and L or something like that, and just like played a lot of volume. And that was really helpful to get me like more rounded as a player. I would say like my live cash game strategy is very, I'm very aggressive, uh, and I'll bluff a lot and stuff because I think that's the weaknesses that opponents have. But then as soon as they show aggression back to me, I'm like I'm out unless I'm like top five or ten percent of my range. So that is very unbalanced and exploitable. You just basically, you just raise me instead of calling me and you, you beat me. So um, when I went online, I had to really start finding more balance and yeah, like being less exploitable, which was totally different to how I played before. Mm -hmm. So it was very useful for that reason. Um, and nowadays I play online mostly just on like, <clears throat> like kind of private games on Poker Bros and stuff like that where it, it basically plays like a live game anyway, but it's convenient when I'm traveling around if like if I haven't got a game that night or I'm tired and I just want to like sit around and just play on my phone. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like why I play online. Yeah, and you basically play most of your time live poker, right? Yeah, I, that, like I would, I would define myself as a live cash game pro. Um, and that's like definitely my speciality. That's what I'm really confident about my game in. Um, and that's, that's what, if I do any coaching, it's always specifically aimed at like one, two or two, five live cash games. Interesting. Okay. So that brings me to my next question because I, I recorded podcast this week with uh, Dietrich Fast, if you know him with, um, also like other, other poker pros this week for like a WSOP preparation. Okay. And we talked about live poker and specifically reading the body language of your opponents. Mm -hmm. you know exploiting exploiting their their tells so how big of a role do you think this plays for you in your game and in general for for live poker okay so i don't know if you know this but i paid three thousand pounds for a five-day live tell coaching course with charlie carroll and okay yeah i saw it on your channel right so yeah. that that was because i'd always 
like believed in the value of live tells. I just didn't know what I was looking for. And like, I'd started noticing things myself about like, I'd noticed trends. Like for example, when someone would bet and they would throw their chips out aggressively like this, it was usually a bluff. Or if they would like bet and then stare you in the eyes, that was usually a bluff. Um, and I noticed when, when people were like more relaxed and kind of like laying back in the chair or like just having more of like a naturally flowing conversation with you still after making the bet, that's usually value. So I noticed some sort of like trends like this, but I was like, I bet there's some like experts out there that like really know the stuff and they've like studied this stuff. Uh, and I think whenever you're looking for someone who like really understands something, if you can find, find an outlier in results, but like they're doing it in a different style than everyone else, like the, the traditionally accepted way, that's what Charlie Carroll is to me. Like he's had, no one can argue that he's had very good results. He plays online and he crushes, but he plays in a way that like a lot of pros would say is like really wacky and weird and like can't be profitable, but like it is. So I was like, how is that? Surely there's something there that I can learn. Um, so that's wh why I saw the value in that. And when I released those, I, I released a two part series on YouTube about that, um, about like the life tell retreat and everything. And a lot of people were like, it, yeah. oh, this is, yeah, they're like, oh, this is nonsense. Like, just like kind of writing it off. Like, you burn three thousand pounds this place, and I was like, yeah, it paid for itself in about three weeks. Wow. After after it, like, there was within the first week, or it, may, it might have even been the first session. Uh, after that, I'm like really looking for the stuff that I learned in people, and there was like one big thing in in particular that he taught us, like it's like a bodily reaction, and like you, you literally can't cover it. So everyone has this tell if you can see it. Um, and I made a really light hero call on the river that I would never do. Cause like I said, my whole life philosophy is overfold to aggression, be over aggressive myself. So I, I'm not going around calling river bets very often. And this guy like over bet jams. And I just like get this read and I, I call and I win. And the pot was like two and a half thousand or something. So it like basically paid for itself straight away. Um, wow. And, yeah. and since then that was, that was probably like a year ago now. <clears throat> and since then there's been like, countless spots where i've found this this one little thing that i learned and this is why i think coaching and and like learning little new things in poker is so valuable because you, like the plan is to play for the rest of my life right so if i learn mm -hmm. like one little thing that every now and again like every month or two wins me a pot that i wouldn't have won otherwise like the value is basically exponential because your win rate increases but then it's it's also you win more which means your bankroll grows more which means you can play bigger which means you make more per hour and it's, yeah, it's exponential. Like the better you get, the, the faster you improve and build your role and everything kind of like starts rolling in the right direction at that point. That, yeah. I, I think live tells it, it's a nice thing to have to sway a close spot. I think most of the time I won't go out of my way and do something just because of a live tell, which I've seen Charlie do. You have to have a lot of confidence in it to do that. Otherwise you end up just punting. Um, but there has been a couple of times where I take like a really crazy line. There was, there was one in, uh, a live stream in Texas that I did recently uh, where I just did something I would never do without the live read and it looked wild the commentators went crazy and it was it was all live tell based it was it was like a limp pot and I check raised like second pair like I had sevens on eight six something in a multi-way pot like four-way limp pot or something I check raised and someone three bet and I jammed because I was like he's just full of shit here Carlos also calls he has second pair Sam's in there Oh no, he raises. Big raise. Big time Mr. Sam raise. Clark. Huge raise. Sam Clark not playing around. On a gator watch, Jim says. And Jay, he's gonna call here. Oh no, he three bets. So he's not buying it. Great play here from Jay. God, we are seeing some huge plays here. What's Sam gonna do here because he does have a this good is, hand. What is, Jay's representing, I guess, just sets here. Yeah, he's representing sets. I mean, Jay could, I guess he could pretty much have any set here. He could have deuces, could have eights, could have sixes. After calling the, the hunt, the, uh... He's gonna get it through. Calling the hundred pre, and then... Oh. He didn't make it that big. Seems like he's kind of inviting Sam to the... Oh my god, and Sam rips it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Jay just lets it go. He says he does not buy it. Wow. What a move by Mr. Sam Clark here. <laughs> uh, which is, it looks crazy. It sounds crazy when I say it, but I mean, I was right. He had like random junkie draw kind of thing. Interesting. Can you share some common life tells that people can look out for when they go to the casinos next time? Uh, yeah, like the ones I mentioned, the, the ones that you'll see regularly, 
uh, you, you just want something that leans you towards like value or bluff. Things that lean towards bluffs is like throwing chips out aggressively, staring you down. It's like anything that like you think they might be doing to try and intimidate you when you're facing a bet is usually they don't want you to call the bet, right? Um, the general body posture or like appearance of a person that's bluffing is usually very like I would say stoic and quiet. Um, like they'll just kind of like be staring at a point at the table, not saying anything, trying not to like move too much or. The, the, the psychology behind that is they don't want to like provoke you into a call. I think it's, it's like stay very still and just like look unintimidating and like kind of like they don't want you to, I don't know. But it's it's different for different people as well. I would say that there's baselines like that. Uh, but then some people will be completely the opposite. So you need to get like showdowns are essential. I would say like pay attention when you're not in a hand, find like these river spots when they're playing against each other. <clears throat> And, and try and decide in your head, like, okay, does this look like a bluff or value? Uh, and then you'll have, if you see their cards, you now have like a solid stone. They did this action. I know they had either value or bluff now, if you see the cards. And then you can go forward with that information. But it's, mm-hmm. I, I'd say it's good to have like the, the ground rules, like the basics and like an idea of what things mean for like population. And then just be willing to tweak that. If cause some people are completely opposite, it's really weird. Interesting. What I do with my clients, I don't know if you know that I was a dating and relationship coach yeah, bef- okay. before becoming a mindset coach. Right. And um, of course, as, as a dating coach, you also talk a lot about body language and psychology. And uh, so I came with a lot of knowledge to the, to the poker world yeah, in that right. terms. And okay. um, when I was doing research on the topic, I, I thought like, ah, oh, I see certain patterns. I see certain things that I see like in on a date or something, yeah, or right. when I talk with couples, I see certain behaviors that I see on a poker table as well. There's certain things, certain similarities that I can also teach my clients. And um, it might sound for some people like, how is it related? Like someone on a date and someone on a poker table. I can, I can but, believe that. I can believe that. Yeah, but it, it, you will be surprised how many things um, have similarities with poker. And one of the things that I see in my clients, because what I do when I when I work with them, I let them send um, certain streams or certain, you know, when, when they were just like, you know, certain things that I can see their body language when they play live poker. Yeah. And these days, like a lot of things will be streamed on YouTube or Twitch or whatever. What I realized or what I saw on, on some of my clients is that some of their tells are extremely obvious, mm-hmm. very obvious. I can, I can give you an example. So one of my clients that I worked with, he was sending over a, a stream that he was in. And um, he was already on the final table and like and still uh, made crucial mistakes. For example, when he had a strong hand, he he had like a, a like a stack of chips, right? Like this. Right. Put them and, in gently or something. Yeah, and and he's like when he's a strong hand, he's like all in, yeah, like super fast, all in, oh. bam. Sometimes he like you know pushes the chips on it, like all in, boom. Yeah, and mm. when he like had a weak hand or a bluff, he's like. Super ah, slow. And interesting. All in, right? That was a, a quite big tell because, of course, I could see the cards. Uh, so it's, yeah. for me, it's always easier to say. Of course. If that's you interesting, though. I wonder if he's doing that like subconsciously because because that's the opposite way around to what I would expect. Okay. Right? Like what, what I've always seen and understood was like putting the chips in aggressively and stuff is more likely a bluff and like quietly just kind of like putting them in there and like being more relaxed and stuff is usually more value. So I wonder if like subconsciously or even consciously he's worked out that that's what people do and hopefully thinks that that's what other like decent players think. And then he's trying to like flip it. Yeah. I, don't, no, I, don't I was know. asking kind of him, I was, I was asking him and he said he, he wasn't even aware of it. Okay. <laughs> it so might've worked think... out well for him because it's like kind of the opposite of what most people do. So he might be like getting called more when he's got it and getting yeah. more through more yeah. And he, yeah i don't know it's interesting yeah. i think that he just felt strong when he had a strong hand actually yeah, he was so yeah he, he was just more yeah. confident yeah. Yeah, yeah so you see certain things like this when you play live poker you have the strategy edge of course very obvious because a lot of times you play against weak people yeah or the rich guys as you said in the beginning yeah yeah and um, but on top of that if you're also smart enough to understand certain body language tells you will yeah. basically like crush uh, the, the the live poker scene this this is a hilarious thing as well. It's like um, in, in poker, there's there's some people you'll play against, and I, th- I think it's like I know that I was saying about like natural talent. I would say like my poker game is like I'm in like a seven out of ten at everything. <laughs> That's why I aim to be like I don't care about being 
like I, I will happily let someone have like a strategy edge on me if they've spent like hundreds of hours in the lab and like they just like have memorized every solve and everything like this. I'm like, good for you. Go ahead. And then they'll come to a, a game of, of like low stake, no limit holding. After spending hundreds of hours in the lab, right? Well, come along and they'll play against this old guy with his coffee there. And they'll be like, well, uh, I've been four bet, but I have to defend with this part of my range. I have to have these five bet buffs. And it's like, no, you don't. <laughs> Stop. Just throwing money away. It's just like they do all of that work and then just forget like the common sense part of like people don't play like you've studied against. People mm-hmm. play very like loose, passive, but like when they put in aggression, it's a very tight range and it's very like condensed. It's just value. There's no bluffs. So you've got to like be able to beat a decent amount of the value. And yeah, it's just like stuff like that where they'll be really well studied and stuff, but then they don't apply it properly. Um, and then that holds them back. They get frustrated. And then this is where like the mind part of it comes in as well i think a lot of otherwise good poker players become unhinged with like the mindset side i think they're very weak mentally where if they don't get like they need to look like entitlement and if they don't get the results immediately everything goes out the window the strategy is in the bin and they're just all over the place mm-hmm. and uh I-, I mentioned to you before we started the call that I-, I have like personal stories about like friends and people i've known who like have failed in poker where they could have otherwise succeeded and it's not a skill thing. Like they were good enough to be professional poker players. It's like either ego gets in the way because they think they're better. Uh, and then they get like entitlement and then they get tilt because of that. I can give a very vague story because it's, it's like someone I know and stuff. But there was a guy uh, that played, I played with him a lot and I respected his game, but he struggled to get out of like 1-1 one, one because of under- my assessment of it is mental game leaks. Being in a rush to win all the money, like immediately, like you would, and then like ego of like wanting to be like seen as like the best player in the room and this kind of thing. You would always have to have the most money on the table, even though his bank or management, that's it probably wasn't good to do that. Um, he would always be like putting on straddles and like trying to make the game bigger and all this kind of thing. And he was one of the more theoretically sound players in the game. But like when you put in all these things together of like he's straddling, he's kind of giving action and trying to make the game bigger. And then he's got this like ego war going on in his own head and, and bad of a bank or management as well. Uh, so like he just hits like a downswing or whatever then he's got no rule so a lot of the time he, he went through the cycle of like he would spin up quickly and then it would all come crashing down again if like a few mm-hmm. things went wrong and he would go broke and he would need staking and stuff like this and he once asked me for staking because he'd already been staked lost some money was in makeup the other staker had dropped him and I'm like well this is obviously not good signs this is red flags that I shouldn't be staking you already right and it's like you're needing staking for like the smallest game that you'll ever find in a live game it was a 1-1 one, one game but I'm like, but it's like, you're a good player. So it's like, it's very annoying. Um, so I said, right, look, I would consider it, but I have to be there in the room with you all the time to make sure he's not drinking or tilted or anything like this. And also I have to coach you once a week. And it was all fine until I said, I have to coach you once a week. And I just saw the ego like flare up and it's like, mm. oh, like, like, I can't accept coaching from you. Like, like he, he thought he was better than me or like, it just like, it just felt uncomfortable to him or whatever. So I ended up not, doing it i said like that those are my terms like if you're not comfortable with it whatever mm-hmm. and i now haven't seen him for months because he is broke and no one will back him wow okay yeah and he okay. should be a pro he should be a pro like he's good enough to be so it's it's mm-hmm. like this stuff is very important maybe like honestly maybe more important than, like i think with poker as if you're playing low stakes cash games especially you need a certain skill level at the game mm-hmm. but it's not that high <laughs> it's really not like to be to be winning at the game at a decent win rate, you need to know what you're doing pre-flop and know when people are strong and when people are weak, and then just act accordingly. That's basically it. Like if you mm-hmm. want to really simplify it, you need to know how to respond to your opponent's weaknesses in the game. That's about it. And like once you've got that box ticked, it's I think it's more valuable working on mindset, like bank call management, like doing all the other things right, which is what I was saying about me being like, I think I'm a seven out of ten at everything. Like I've never had bankroll problems. I've never gone broke. I've never even gone anywhere near other than when I started like 3K. Since then, it's all been good, you know? Uh, I've never really had big downswings. I think I've had like one or two losing months ever in five years, which I think is probably rare. Um, and yeah, I just do all the easy, easy stuff that people overlook well. And I think that's like the secret to my success, I would say. Mm, awesome. Awesome. And you also said something that I'm, I'm really eager to know. You said you had uh, earlier this week, uh, a call with some people that you work with mm-hmm. and they ask you certain topics about mindset. So what did you talk about? I'm curious. Yeah. Okay. So 
I was doing a coaching call. Like I said, I do like once or twice a week when I've got some free time, I try and do like a, a group call with some people who are trying to work on their cash games. And we were, I was actually playing on a poker bros game and I was live streaming the table to, to my students. And we were like talking through the hands as like live. I was doing like a live play and explain kind of thing. Uh, and I mentioned that I was going to be on this call and I was like, right guys, um, what things do you struggle with mental game wise? Like what kind of things cause you problems? And one of the main things that they all kind of said was knowing when to leave a game. Cause like in a cash game, the, the main benefit of doing it for a living, like you said, is you can start and finish when you want it. So you've got complete autonomy. You've got like complete control over your own working life, which is what, not what you get with tournaments. But the downside is you're now in control. There's no one telling you, okay, stop playing. Now you're tilted. You're tired. The game's not good anymore. So you have to work all this stuff out on the fly while you're doing, you're already concentrating on playing poker well. So that was the thing they said they struggled with, like knowing when to leave and like, should it be a monetary amount? Like if you're down a certain amount of buy-ins or if you're up a certain amount of buy-ins and the, the, the kind of mental biases that they had around that kind of thing. And I said that this used to be something I struggled with and it wasn't necessarily uh, me struggling with it. Actually, it was an external factor, which was my dad which mm. is like an interesting personal story that we'll go into. So my take on it <clears throat> was you should think about the rest of your life playing poker as one session. And whether you're up or down this session, if you zoom out and look ahead to 50 years from now, it's not going to matter at all. Like literally not at all. It'll be a speck on the graph, right? You being down 3,000 pounds in a one-two game right now might feel really bad. But if you really zoom out and think about it like that, it doesn't really matter. Is the game good? Do you have an edge in it? Are you tired? Are you playing well? If, it, if all the things point to you, like keep playing, then keep playing. Be honest with yourself and like actually be self-aware. And are you actually playing well? Or are you telling yourself you're playing well? Like that kind of thing. I would say for me personally, my answer is if I have an edge in the game and I haven't got anything like else that I would like rather be doing for like life EB or like I'm not tired or tilting or anything like that, then I'm playing. What, what, like mm -hmm. I'm already here. I've already got chips on the table. I'm already in a game that I presume I'm winning in. Why would I leave? Um, so it doesn't really matter if I'm winning or losing like that for me. The issue I had with my dad, like I said, he kind of played poker a bit, which is sometimes for like close like friends and family and stuff, that's kind of sometimes more annoying than the people who just don't understand it at all. And they'll just take your word for things. So like at the point where I'd been playing professionally for like a year or two, I'd been playing semi-professionally for a year or two before that. And I've, I've been a profitable player for probably like three or four years now, right? My dad it's nice that he wanted to like be involved and like see how I'm doing and this kind of thing. So he would always message me when I was playing and be like, Oh, how's it going? And he would message me, I don't know, like halfway through my session. I'd be like, oh, I'm like, I'm up 2000. It's going well. And then five hours later, I would finish. And he'd be like, Oh, how did you finish? And I'd be like, Oh, I won 1200 or whatever. And he'd be like, Oh, you should have left. And it's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, easier said than done. Right. Oh yeah. If I just like, telepathically knew the peak of every session like magically then sure i would always leave at the exact peak but like you, you don't know and every hour i play poker i am earning an hourly my month might be i win ten thousand in the first three hours and then lose for the rest of the month but that's i still made an hourly do you know what i mean mm -hmm. like it can come in crazy ways the thing that like people who don't play poker for a living or for profit at least don't seem to understand is like you just got to think in the long run like the more hours i play the more i'm gonna win yes that session might have been better if i left earlier but then i might have like when I start my next session, that, 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 that 800 downswing happens or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And it's trying to make people understand that I think is very difficult. And I always had this like war with him. Like he actually said at one point, if you just like focus on a playing poker and you let me manage when you start and finish, you'll make more money. And I was like, no. <laughs> no, because, no, I don't no, think Because so. <laughs> every time I'm up, you'll tell me to leave and I'll probably be in a really good game that I'm printing like 100 an hour in and now I leave. And then like what, when I'm losing, I keep playing because... I need to win the money back. It's just so like, mm. it's just like, that's not how it works. That's not how you need to be thinking about it. It's not like a productive way to go about things. And then it causes like friction with like loved ones as well, which is dumb. Like there's, it's, there's no point. So at some point I, I just started like tuning that out. Um, I mean, what, what, what's your take on like, wh when should you leave a session? When should you, and, and what do you think about like family involvement and stuff like that as well? I can, I can tell you from my experience, Having family members involved into any kind of poker thing, yeah, like basically letting them make any kind of decisions is usually not the smartest way. Because I can also tell you some stories from my experience. I had clients who shared with their parents like everything. Like yeah. today I play a session. So for that amount of time, this is either lost or I won that amount. 
And sometimes when they're in adult right. swing, maybe they can handle it from a mindset perspective, but their parents can't. And then right. they said, ah, session again, I lost 3000 again. Yeah. And then you see like the mother is shaking and starting to cry or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. if and you see like your mother crying every day, exactly. Yeah. If, if you see your mother crying every day, you like, this will affect you at some point. Yeah. So I said to them, stop talking to them. Yeah. Like you can tell them maybe once That's a month. That's tough, but it's probably, months. yeah. Yeah. That's actually why I, that was kind of like the solution I tried sort of like subtly in, implementing with my dad where he'd be like, oh, like, how's the session going? And I would just be like, going well. Yeah. <laughs> and I just wouldn't say anything. Like, and then I would say like, ask me after a week, how the week went. Or ask me after a month, how the month went. And I'm, I'm fine telling you those results because that's more zoomed out now. And it's more likely like every month, like I said, I've had like two losing months or something. So like mm -hmm. every month I pretty much win and it's like, okay, there you go. But yeah. like, he's still, it's also like, it's kind of nice that he wants to know how it's going and stuff like that as well. It's kind of like, I, I think the most important thing there. for our parents is that first of all, we like what we do. We enjoy it. And that yeah. we, we still make money with it. Yeah. I think that is the most yeah. important thing. Like, for example, if you ask my grandmother, she's like, she, I don't know if she knows exactly what I'm doing, you know, I'm working with poker players from all over the world on their mindset, you know, like online. Yeah. So like, yeah. I don't know if my, my grandmother really understands that, but she knows that I'm super happy and I'm, I really enjoy what I'm doing. So she's happy for me. And if she's, if she's like, how is it going? I'm like, good. Yeah, like, right. that's all she that's, needs to know. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's like my mom's thoughts on it. Like she doesn't know, it's almost, it's easier and it's nicer than when it's just like, she doesn't care. It's just like, she doesn't understand it anyway. So it's just like, is it going well? Yes, cool. You yeah, know, like, exactly. my, my, because my dad knows like a little tiny bit about poker. He tries to like, yeah, like kind of like in, intervene a little bit or like micromanage. Like, in like he's trying to help me. It's like a nice thing, but it's like just trust me that I know what I'm doing. Like I know more about it than you. And like we would get in these like long debates, but like I, when I was trying to explain like variance and like all like the swings of it and all this kind of thing to him, and I was like, oh, what am I doing? Like I'm just wasting my time. Yeah, and energy here. Like, exactly. But then yeah. you don't want to be rude. You don't want to be rude either. But it's like, yeah, just like. Trust me, I've got it, you know, relax. Mm. And, and it comes, like I say, it comes from a good place of me wanting to do well. And like, like you were saying, it's like, they, they want to know that you're winning, but like, because my dad knows like a tiny bit about poker, it's like, he thinks like, yeah, I don't know, like he can help me win though. Yeah. He's like trying to like, trying to like leak bust me, but like with like, <laughs> yeah. no understanding of like the hands or anything like that. So to come back to your original question, I tell you my thoughts on like when to stop because, um, a lot of cash game players that I work with also ask me a similar question. And you can definitely have a monetary stop, but I'm not a big fan of it because it's very simple to say like, for just as an example, let's say 250 big blinds is basically your stop loss. And then you have 250 big blinds that you lost. And then you're like, ah, I like but 300, I, I stretch it to 300. And then you lose 300 and like, Ah, but like it starts to get better. Maybe I can do 400. And then like, mm. so a lot of people, they don't even follow their own rules. So I like to yeah. have a little bit of a different approach that I tell my clients is that first step is always awareness to solve any problem in mindset. You need to be aware. I don't know if you know, but if you go to rehab, for example, you know, let, let's say, you know, someone who is addicted to, to alcohol and he drinks every day. The first step that, that they do with him in a rehab is to teach them that he is addicted. Because a lot of people like, that drink like make alcohol them actually they, accept it mentally. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people that drink alcohol, they're like, but why it's normal. All my friends drink too every day. Yeah. So, right. you know, why is that odd? Yeah? So basically they, they make them realize that drinking every day is not normal. You are addicted most likely. Yeah? And yeah. this is the first step that you are aware of like, how good do you perform? This is the key. So you should definitely know how do I feel? When I'm on a table and I'm really playing perfect game, yeah, my A game, I know, as you said, yeah, you, you focus on the other hands, you watch the body language of people, you exploit them, you're really in the hand, you think clearly, you have a clear path of making decisions and stuff like that. You're fully focused. You should know when you have your A game. So if you know your A game, you know if you like subtract like 10, 20% where your B game is, where your C game is, and so on and so forth. And the second step is, I call this awareness card. So for example, what is your favorite poker card? Uh, like queen of spades or something. Okay. So, so for example, every <laughs> time you see the queen of spades in either in your own hand or on the board or in a showdown, this is when you have that little second or five seconds of checking in with yourself and asking yourself, you can have certain KPIs, but for example, okay, 
which game do I play? Do I play my A game or B game or C game? Am I still profitable? Can I still focus? Do I still want to be in that game? You have certain KPIs that you can follow. I, I, I tell my client certain KPIs that they always have to ask themselves. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure you 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 know when you play your A game and what you need to really play your A game. And if you ask yourself that question and you say like, oh, everything is fine. I'm playing my B game, but I'm on a good table. I'm still profitable. Continue. Mm-hmm. But as soon as you see your favorite card and you say like, ah, I don't want to really be here. I'm not focused. I drifting off mentally, you know, I'm thinking yeah. about being on the beach or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Then you're like, okay, it's time, time to go. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I like that. What I always tell my clients is that they should have that belief of like, if I play my A game, I can beat everyone. This is what I what I want my clients to think every session. Yeah. Also just be overqualified. So like when I'm in England now, I still play that same one one game that I started at five years ago. But like at the time, if I wasn't on my A game, maybe I wasn't winning or I was like not at like a big win rate back then. But now I feel like my C game, I'm just kind of paying attention. I know roughly what player profiles they are. And like I just have these like default exploits in my mind now. Like, okay, if someone check Riz's turn, I just fold everything that's not two pair plus. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like stuff like that. So like uh, yeah, I can just kind of like autopilot and I feel like I will still be winning. But when the game gets good, it's like I, I feel like I can turn it on and off a little bit as well. Like if I just need to get volume in and like like I can be doing something else on my phone, like editing a video, for example, and I'm just kind of loosely paying attention to the dynamics of the table. And then if the game suddenly gets really good and it gets big, I can go, like, okay, A game needed now. Switch, switch on, like turn off the phone, put it away, pay attention. I like it. Some people, they can really do that. Yeah. It's not a lot of people, not everyone who thinks you can do that can do that, but yeah. some people, they can really do it. And that is, um, yeah, that can be very, very powerful. I would say that most of the things you need to know to be able to win at poker is learned. It's not like a, I don't think anyone's just naturally like knows when to find the river check raise bluff or whatever like that. Obviously, like you learn things and it's all about like hand reading and stuff like that. I think the natural talents you can have in this game are like things about you as a person that benefit gambling for a living. So like I've never been scared of risk, basically. I would say like I'm always if I think something is a good idea, but like the negative outcome of that idea could be like very bad, I'm still like willing to do it if I think it's like overall a positive thing um and also just like uh emotional stability in like sad situations and like really happy situations i would say i'm closer to my baseline than the average person so like i don't have big emotional swings i think i'm just quite stable across the board like i remember my mom being like i had this dog when i was a kid and it, i probably had it from when i was like seven until i was like 16 or something like that she got cancer and died and i, I it was while i was at school that like i, I went to school which was fine and then I came back from school and my mom was like crying, mess. The dog wasn't there. I was like, what's going on? She's like, oh, the dog died. And it was like, obviously like a complete shock. And I just had nothing. Like mm-hmm. I was sad, but like outwardly, it's just like nothing at all. And she's like, is my son a psychopath? Like, why is he not like sad or crying? That yeah. This dog that you love died. Uh, and I, I, I don't have any explanation. For that. Like I was just, I was sad, but like not, I can't continue with my day and like, like, I feel like I feel the emotions, but I can still act how I know is like the correct way to act. So in a poker game, I think that's very good. Like I can take really bad coolers or bad beats or like someone gets really lucky on me. Someone's being like deliberately tilting, like like trying to annoy me or like saying things to try and trigger me. And I just like brushes off. Like it doesn't really annoy me. So I think that's really good. for poker. That's, that's my natural talent in poker is I'm very stable. I don't get too carried away and like, too happy when I'm on an upswing. I don't start th- like overestimating my own talent or anything like that. I'm like, I'm just on an upswing. And then I, when I'm on a downswing, it's the same thing the other way around. I don't be like, oh, like I'm trash. I, I need to get better at the game. And I'm just like, no, it's just down. Mm-hmm. So I just like, I think I, I see everything very realistically. Like I'm a realist, not a pessimist, not an optimist. I'm just kind of like, see it as it is, act accordingly, regardless of feelings. And like, I, I, I think I can do that in a hand as well. So like, yeah, I don't get like emotional and I'm like, oh, this guy keeps trying to bluff me. Like I hear that a lot in hand histories. Like, oh, this guy's been like bluffing me quite a lot recently. So like I have to call here. It's like, no, no, no. Like what's your hand properties and values? Like what's the actual table dynamic? Stuff like that. So yeah, I yeah. think being objective, self-aware and like emotional control is is all like very important natural talents in poker. But you can probably work on those as well, to be fair. Yeah, but it's I always nice to have a natural talent in the in this, right? And like, I never realized this was like a talent that could help me in life or like even a talent. It's just like, that's just how I am. It's just how I've always been. Um, yeah. And it just, it turns out that it 
lends itself well to playing poker for a living. Mm-hmm. And like, it is brutal. The, the reality of doing it, like it seems really fun and it truly is. Like I feel very, very lucky to be a professional poker player because I've experienced like the, the norm of society. Like I had like a nine to five job in an office and I was miserable for years. And I just felt so out of place and I was like, I don't belong here. Like just unhappy and just like feeling like unfulfilled and just like, I don't know how else to explain it. Just like this wasn't my environment at all. And as soon as I started my first day, like playing poker full time, it was just like this like sigh of relief. Like, oh yes, this is right. You know, like I'm in control of my own. I also, I went from one of the laziest people to like one of the hardest working people overnight. And the, the difference was when I had a full-time job with a salary, I could be the least productive or the most productive person in the entire office and I'd get paid the exact same. Whereas as soon as I've worked for myself playing poker, if I work more hours, I make more money. If I get better at the game, I make more money. So, and like, I'm greedy. I want the money. So like, what do I do to get more of it? If yeah. I'm going to be spending my time doing something and I, and I can make money from it, why not make the absolute most I can? So yeah, I literally like, like the light switch. I went from being super lazy, like just trying to like avoid doing work and just like making excuses and stuff like that when I had the job to, I will stay up all night, not sleep, studying, and then go back and play again as soon as the game opens. I like yeah. that. It's super inspiring. And and I've been there too. And I know exactly where you're coming from. And I'm sure that people who watch this have similar experience, or at least can imagine that um, they will have a similar experience when they go through that the same progress that that you went through. I would like to talk about your coaching a little bit. So obviously, you mentioned it, you, you coach people. Can you tell me a little bit about it or the people that watch um, this episode and also how they can reach out to you? Yeah. Um, so I would say if you're looking to like really know the game inside out and like be an absolute sicko crusher, I'm not the guy. <laughs> I'm the guy that can teach basically anyone to be a professional poker player and like the actual realities of what it is and how to do it. Because like, there's no real reason other than, like I said, about like the emotional stability that I should be able to do it and other people shouldn't. Like, I don't have a higher IQ than anyone. Like, I'm not crazy talented in any way like that i just learned it and I, i have a very realistic approach to things and that's how i kind of went about learning the game of poker i i just sometimes you stumble like i stumbled onto it and it just felt right it clicked um and yeah suddenly like you feel you see feel loads of passion towards it so my coaching is um very realistically based it's 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 focused on live low stake cash games which i think is the easiest way to make a living from poker in 2023 and onwards. I can't see that changing. Live cash games are the softest games. Like people just come in to blow off steam after work and they don't really care what they're doing. And we can, that means that there's huge imbalances and weaknesses in their game that we can let them exploit. And the, the good news is you don't really have to learn it for each individual player because the whole population plays the same of like recreational fish basically. So you just learn to crush those players and that's where all your win rate comes from. And then like the, the soft skills of like being a pro as well which is like good table image, getting into private games. You can be a winning player, but you have to offer something back in return, whether that's good conversation or like you can connect people of like that are valuable to each other or whatever. Like you bring cookies to the game. Like there's always something you can add a value to a, a game, right? Yeah. And often the highest hourlies are going to be found in these private games. And so like the logistics of being a pro as well, like, okay, like in your area, what have you got around? Okay, if there's nothing good where you can make whatever target hourly you want an hour, we need to move somewhere else. Like stuff like that. Um, the actual nuts and bolts of like literally how to be a professional poker player. Um, so that's kind of what we focus on. Uh, the, the way it's ran is through a discord and whenever there's two or three people available and I have some time, we'll jump on a call. Um, and we'll do, I'll do kind of like a lecture style, uh, with some strategy. Maybe I'll like watch like a live stream I've played on and do like an explanation of my thought process. And, Uh, and then usually I get the students to do a couple of their hand histories and everyone in the group on the call, um, give some feedback and then we close out with my thoughts on everything. That's kind of what I do. I absolutely love what you do because I think that is very rare. I don't know if there's anyone else who does it exactly like you just explained it. Yeah. And the reason why I love it even more is because I always say that you make the most amount of money in life poker by exploiting people. Right. Yeah, and 100%. so I'm one of the least GTO pros you'll find. Like, I understand it to an extent. I think you have to. You need to know what the baseline is so that you can spot when someone veers off from it and then you go the other way. But 
but like you just need a rough idea you don't need to i think people get too obsessed and like in the weeds with it and then like i was saying before about how they'll be so like in the head about the strategy and like, oh, oh, oh like this hand needs to be a bluff or like this hand needs to be a um like a bluff catch or whatever because of like the combination like i've got the queen of spades or whatever right whereas it's like this guy hasn't bluffed in 30 years he has not done one he would be <laughs> he offended. doesn't even know how to do it <laughs> if you said are you bluffing he'd be offended he'd be like no i don't bluff what do you think this is you didn't steal from you we're friends yeah. this is like you, you, you just miss like glaringly obvious information when you like yeah. get too into it i think um so yeah I, I try and like what's the most important information i think a lot of people's thought processes get bogged down and they, they're thinking about the wrong things and like the pressure of the moment like you've got eight people staring at you waiting like wanting to hurry up the dealer's like tapping the table like come on it's on you and it's like i know like i'm thinking like a lot of the time you just get this like brain fog so i i have like a very concise and like to the point thought process it's like, mm-hmm. what's opponent's range? What's my hand? What are we going to do? That's pretty much it in every decision point. Um, yeah, I just try and make things simple. I'm, I'm all for like simplifying things um, and just trying to make things easy to remember and making everything as easy as possible for myself in game. And that's what I try and teach people as well. And like the, the greatest, like, like coaching is just a side thing for me. I, I enjoy it and like I really enjoy helping people. My main thing is I'm still a current cash game pro and I plan to be for the next. 30 40 years until i retire if i ever do like i might just i I love the game a lot so i just genuinely might not um Mm. but i would say if i wish i had me now 10 years ago like when i first started like getting a passion and interest in the game if i had me now i'd have been a pro in six months whereas in reality it took four or five years i was working a full-time job that i didn't like and it just wasted so much time and literally, I was, I remember I was in my full-time job. I would sit there. You know, I said I was lazy and I like looking for excuses and stuff. Mm-hmm. I would sit there with like my emails open on the big screen that everyone can see. And then on my little screen down here, I would have like poker. I'd be like reading a poker book because <laughs> <Like, laughs> I was just so into it. And then I would like go to work, finish work at like 5 p.m., go to the casino, <laughs> play it till like midnight, go to the gym, sleep, repeat. And I did that for like four years. And like, that's what mm-hmm. it took to get me to where I was when I could then quit my job and, and play full-time. I think you could cut out a lot of that by just having someone to just like cut out all the noise, say, this is the important stuff to know. We can work on the nice, fancy, nice to have things later, but here's how you win now. And like, just cut out all the crap. And Mm. yeah, it's so much easier just paying someone to do that than working out all the hard and long and slow way yourself. And like picking up bad habits and stuff like that as well. Mm. Like on the GTO to like exploitative argument as well, to give you an idea, when I'd not studied at all and I was just like working out the game for myself, I'd read like maybe a couple of books and things like that. Um, had studied it all. I was winning, I think like 15 pounds an hour and I was like, I need to make it a little bit more an hour so I can quit my job. Uh, and then I got an upswing course, which is very like, it's Doug Polk's thing. It's very like GTO based. Uh, and I started losing <laughs> because I was like, oh, minimum defense frequency. I'm going to go as far as my range here. And I just started like paying off nits all the time and stuff. Like it's just, Live low stakes is like a totally different breed of poker where it's not really like poker. You just have to play really exploitative. And like, I find that fun, luckily. But yeah, if you're wanting to play like perfectly balanced real poker, like that's online and you're not going to win any money. <laughs> so mm-hmm. like, if you want to make a living, we're going to play live low stakes cash and we're going to exploit the hell out of people. That's what I want. Awesome. I love that. I love that. And yeah, as you said, paying someone to help you take a shortcut is a lot of times the right way to do it. And I see this the people that I work with a lot because some of the, the people that come to me who are like semi-professional poker players or want to become a, a pro and um, I help them mentally to get there. And you do the, basically the same just in terms of strategy and finding the right game. So right. we have yeah. that in common for sure. So how can people reach out to you? Yeah, the best way I get hold of me would be my Instagram, which is Sam Black Poker. Um, if you want to watch some of my... If you want to see how I play, because I would say like I don't play like a lot of pros as well, so it's kind of a yeah, very like exploitative, very you'll see. If you want to see how I play, look on YouTube. That's Sam Clark Poker as well. Um, there's like a backlog of vlogs on there. I've been making videos for probably like four years, but like I said, not consistently. So sporadically, there'll be like loads of them, and then a big gap, and then there'll be loads again. Um, so you can actually see the progression of my game as well and how it's changed, which is interesting. Um, yeah, I, that, that's the two places to find me. I would say. Um, thanks for having me on. It's been fun. Perfect. Yeah, it was a pleasure talking to you. Anything you want to share before I let you go? Uh, that's it. I just love talking poker. 
<laughs> Anytime you need yeah, a guest, me too. You, you hit me up. Let me know. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for being here.